What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over part 6 of the Blueprint Only Input Buffer Tutorial series. So, what we're going to be doing today is converting our times and seconds and durations to frames. So instead of time, we're going to use frames. Now, in this specific type of project, like my Action RPG Tutorial series, which is where I am demonstrating the Blueprint Only Input Buffer, the conversion from seconds to frames might not be necessary. However, this blueprint only input buffer series is meant for all projects. And specifically, I'm going to model it to be able to do everything the C++ input buffer can do from the fighting game. And in that we absolutely want to use frames, not seconds. And if you do want more precision in these other projects, not just the fighting games, you're going to want to use frames, not seconds, because that will allow you to get to the specifics of an animation or you know if you have a frame cap you can pretty much estimate how long you know 60 frames you're, you can guess would be like one second if you're running at 60 fps so there is a lot we can actually do with this that is useful in other projects but it's especially useful in the fighting game tutorial series and so we are going to cover it today in depth we're going to do it now and it's going to be a pretty short episode but we're going to do it now because in the fighting game we did it after the the what's going to be the next episode of the blueprint only input buffer and we are going to use it like crazy in there so we want to do this before to knock that stuff out this way we don't have to deal with going back and changing a bunch of stuff we're going to go ahead and get started but before we do if you want to get caught up to everything we've done for the blueprint only input buffer i'll link you to the first episode of that right here it's a little mini series and again you can use it in any of your projects or any of my projects here so feel free to use it as you see fit but if you want to catch up and see how we've done everything and how we're going to continue building on this there's episode one alternatively if you just want to catch up and check out this tutorial series if you like what you see here for the third person action rpg tutorial series this guy right here and see how we did the inventory and the quest and enemies and all that sort of stuff, I'll link you to this playlist right here, which is every episode to cover that specific content. And with that, we are good to go. We can go ahead and get started. As I said, this is Blueprint only, so we don't have to go into the code today for anything. Done everything in Blueprints. There's going to be two things that i got to open up outside of my character where we're doing our input buffer logic, and that is our f input info and f command info structures. This is because we're going to change our times to, like I said, frames. So for me, I'm going to go into my blueprints, and I believe it's in the logic folder, correct? And I'm going to go into my f input info. This is the first one we got to do. So let's go in there and let's change this. So we have name, timestamp, and status. So f input info represents the input that we pressed. If we're on a controller, you know, it could be the, the left face button, which on an Xbox controller is the X button. If we're on a keyboard, it could be each individual key. So it would have the name, the timestamp of when we pressed it, and if we pressed, released, or if we're currently holding it. So for the timestamp, it was previously a float, and that is good if you want to use seconds. If you want to use frames like we're going to do here, then you're going to want to use either integer or integer 64. Now, integer is a lot smaller than integer 64, but integer 64 can hold a larger number. All of these, all variables, they have a maximum size. And so frames go up really quickly. Uh, if you're running 60 frames a second and you run the game for an hour, I mean, you're doing 60 times essentially 3,600. And so at that point, you know, you could have this huge number and you might actually go out of the bounds of the, the integer, in which case you could cause a crash or this would stop working as intended. Now there are ways around that by simply resetting the, the timestamp to be a value between zero and 60 and that sort of behavior. But if you wanna capture the actual frame that is passed in, you can just use an integer 64 like I am here. So go ahead and make that change. And when you do that, before we do anything else, let's go fix up the errors that are gonna be created with this because when we make that change from a float to an integer 64, there's going to be two things that don't work right off the bat. So in our base character BP, which is where we're doing all of our blueprint only input buffer logic, I have this perform input logic function, which gets called basically when any of the important inputs are pressed. So any of the inputs that actually add an input to the input buffer, we add it to the input buffer 
and we do all of our other logic like checking to see if we matched a command by starting from this function. So we press an input and we call perform input logic. That's this guy right here. Then depending on if it's a press or release, we do slightly different logic. And we go from there. We're not worried about what happens after that right now. But right here, at this particular part, we have add input to input buffer. And what this does is it takes in an input info structure and we've split it up so that we can pass in the variables that we want. So we were passing in the name that we found bound to that input we pressed, the timestamp from get time seconds, and a status of pressed or released depending on the switch statement that we entered earlier. But if you come in here and try and compile now, you'll most likely get an error because the float cannot convert to integer 64, at least not the way this is trying to do it. It's just trying to do a direct insert. And so you'll get an error. Now you could do this, get time seconds, drag it back in, and you won't get an error. You will get a conversion, but we actually don't want to do that. We don't want to use get time seconds anymore because we actually have a get frame count that will return the current frame count. So it can actually pass in the exact frame as opposed to trying to do a conversion from seconds to frames. So you literally type get frame count, hit enter, and this returns an integer 64, so it's very, very easy. You just plug it into each of these, and you can get rid of your get time seconds, make sure it is not plugged into anything on this variable or this function. Compile and save. If you have any errors because it's saying you have an extra variable here or something, that happens when you change a blueprint structure and sometimes a code structure. So you may need to just go into this, right click on the node and hit uh, refresh nodes right here. And this should get rid of any weirdness that came from the uh, structure being changed. So there you go, it's a very simple change, but that fixes that error. You will also have another error in our remove old inputs from buffer function. So this function, it gets called to remove inputs when they're out of date. And we were doing that based off like a 0.2 seconds. So once 0.2 seconds have passed, we were marking them as, as outdated. They shouldn't be used anymore. However, we're gonna use frames now. So we need to make sure that we go into a remove old inputs from buffer. Again, you'll have an error here. This is the logic we had, okay? So if you, one second, let's put this up here to look at. All right, so this is what we were doing. Instead of these three nodes here that I have highlighted, we were using these three nodes here. So you can see we're actually doing the exact same process, but I've just changed what it is that we're, we're passing into this less than, okay? Because we don't wanna use time anymore, but frames. And so this timestamp now, we have this input buffer and we break it and grab each F input info that's in it. This timestamp now is going to be an integer 64, not a float. So again, you may have to right click and refresh this node. But if you don't, you'll just see that this will not go into this uh, without giving you an error or unless you drag it back in. If you drag it back in, it will convert for you. But again, we don't want to even convert because we're not trying to compare time seconds to frames. So I'm getting rid of my old logic here and I'm getting this new logic in here. So I still have my break here with my timestamp, but instead of get time seconds, I use get frame count again. And since this is an integer 64, instead of float minus float, we're going to grab, we're going to drag off the, the get frame count return value and uh, just type subtract or the minus sign and then hit subtract. You'll automatically get this light green, which is the integer 64 color. And then you can pass in an arbitrary value if you want. We're going to set up a, a better way to do this um, where we have like a constant value, but we haven't set that up yet. So you can use just an arbitrary hard-coded value of 30 here if you want. 30 is probably a little too high if you want these really specific inputs because that's like half a second. But it really does just depend on what you want. I did 30 so that's easy to enter these commands. So if I go in here, um, you won't be able to do this just yet. Kind of skipping ahead here, but I want to show you something. So I go to my base character BP. I scroll down to the input buffer here. So watch as I press these two inputs, I perform a command, right? Now let's open these both up. Whoops. Okay, let's open these guys up. And let's go back into here. 
Now, as I do this, okay, so you can see I entered this command. These were entered one frame apart. So, of course, I was able to trigger the command. Now, let's say I did this a little bit slower, okay? And you can see, as I'm entering these values, you can kind of see what they are. So, 7484, those were 10 frames apart. If I slow it down, 189 to 215, that's still within 30 frames. But if I slow it down too much, like that was 412 to 448, which is outside of 30 frames, I did not perform the command. So, that's all. We're just changing it from seconds to frames. All right, and once you get this minus in here, by the way, just because I was using that as an example, if you need to get this this uh, less than node, A is less than B, you just drag off of an integer 64, and you can do less than, and you'll get it. And just drag in your result here. And then we're going to bring that into the branch as opposed to what was the previous float less than. After those simple changes, you should be able to compile and save and everything should be working well, you should get that green compile sign. Now, with that done, we can go back to our structures again, and we're going to go to F command info this time. All right, so F command info had name inputs and has used command. I've added a new variable now, and you have two options for this. So another thing that we need, and we're not going to utilize it today, but we're going to very much need to do this, is that we need to know how long we have to input frames before we are, you know, that those inputs are no longer valid. They should either be removed from the array or ignored. So in the case of where we just were, the remove old inputs from buffer, you could use that variable here. So say we have 12 in our F command info, and we passed F command info in, we would have 12 here. Okay, this is specific to each command when we do it on here. You could also have a constant variable that holds your value, and you wouldn't have to do it on every command, but every command would be the same. You could put a constant value that has 12, and no matter what, it would be 12 frames everywhere across all commands. So you only need to put it in F command info if you want it to be able to be separate for each command. They can be the same, but they could potentially be different using this method. So I call this max frames between inputs. Either way, we're going to need a variable for it. So I'd recommend just putting it in here for now if you're not sure, because this gives you the most freedom. It'll be super easy to change later. And so I've added a new variable right here, plus add variable. And max frames between inputs is what I called it. But basically, this is the frame difference between inputs that will still be accepted. If I press 15 frames apart, and this max frames between inputs is only 12, well, that was too far apart between these inputs. So we're not going to register it as a command. They're just going to be separate inputs. Okay. Now, in here, you don't have to do anything with the, the specifics of this variable. I just made an integer 64 because it is a frame. But in all actuality, it should really just be an integer. Okay, because yes, frames are integer 64s by default. But if it's just an integer, the thing is, this is the max frame between inputs. It's not going to reach those high values that, that the current frame or the elapsed frames might reach, in which case you're not going to need the extra space that is provided with an int64. So I would just use a regular int here. And when you do this, it's not going to change anything within your uh, base character BP. Like nothing is going to be affected by that because we're not going to utilize it today. We just want it in here so we can utilize it. On top of that, though, if you click in, on the uh, default values tab, you can go and set these values to specifics as a default. So uh, if there's nothing else in there, you can set default. Now, normally everything would be left alone. However, since, like I said, you can kind of treat this as a constant value, unless you want to set it for every command, we should probably give it a minimum value that... Uh, will work for, for commands in case we don't want to set it. I was using 12 as an example, but there you go. We can use 12 here. And that means that this value will be 12 on every F command info by default. Doesn't mean that we can't change it. Okay, so if we go into our base character BP, and let's click on class defaults, we have a command list. Okay. Now, we have 
commands in the command list, and this one is special move one, special move two being pressed. If I have max frames between inputs here, you see it starts at 12, it doesn't start at zero. If it started at zero, and we went on and, and worked on the next episode, finished it, what would actually happen is we would not be able to complete it because we would have to press both of these inputs on the exact same frame, because if even one frame passed, then it would be higher than the default value, which would be zero. We don't want that. That's why I recommend giving it a default value. All right, now there's one other thing we should do for today's episode to keep our tick value within zero to 60 frames, okay? So we have our, our timestamp, which is the actual frame it was entered. That's fine and that can stay. You could also cap it between zero and 60. Like I said, that's fine too. We'll go over that more in the next episode because we're going to use it pretty heavily next episode. The next one's gonna be a big episode because we're gonna work on that circular input buffer, which is super important, but also pretty involved. So we'll go over that then. Regardless though, we do need a variable that is from zero to 59 really is what it is. It's 60 inputs, but zero to 59 because we need to access as many frames as we want to keep track of in a circular fashion so that we can roll over. So what I did is every frame that we're gonna have, if we have 60 frames per second, if that's our thought, then we can have 60 frames being tracked. We can keep track of a second worth of frames of data, input data. To do this, we need a variable that can keep track of which frame inputs were entered on. Now, I moved some of my variables around here just so it was a little bit cleaner, but everything is the same here except to curve tick. So you can move yours to match mine if you want, or you can leave them how you have them. It's not a problem. But make sure we add a new variable now. And I called it curve tick, and it is just a regular integer. Okay. Now, it's going to start at zero, naturally, and that's good. Basically, all we want to do is every tick, we want to increment the, the frame to go to the next one because tick occurs once per frame. And so we know every tick is one frame passing. Again, a circular input buffer is used to keep track of the data that we want and then remove the old data that's old. So if we have 60 frames that we're keeping track of, and like I said, that's index 0 to index 59, then we want to make sure we have an array that has 60 slots in it. So we're going to be able to use indices 0 through 59. So that's what our cur tick value should be. It should be 0 through 59, and then it should reset back to 0. What I've done is I've handled the event tick here. We weren't doing that before. Now, we very well may do this in the, in the third-person tutorial series at some point. So notice that... Uh, right now we haven't, but you might have stuff in here, and we might have stuff in the future. So just be a just keep that in mind. But if you just right click and type event tick, you can bring it onto the graph if it's not already there. Otherwise, it will bring you to it. And our logic here is honestly quite simple. We have our cur tick variable, which was zero. Now we want to increment this, but if it goes if it's going to go above 59 on the incrementation, on the increment, we want to make sure that we reset it back to zero. So I'm literally going to check if cur tick is less than 59. Okay. Because if it is 59, 59 plus one is going to be 60, which will go out of bounds. But if it's less than 59, the maximum it could be is 58. 58 plus one is only 59. So logically, it makes sense. Bring this into a branch. If it's true that it is less than 59, we can add to it. So what I do is I take my cur tick again, and then I increment it, and it is called increment int, which will increase this value by one. And it sets it for you, okay? If it's false, this means Kurtik is either 59 or greater than 59, in which case we just want to reset Kurtik back to zero. And it's literally that simple. That's the logic I have right here. This will keep our 
per tick at a value we actually care about. Now this will work if you don't have ticks set up in your code or anywhere else. For us, I have my third person tutorial character.cpp and it's got tick at the very bottom. So if I go to play this and add a breakpoint, when I play this, you'll see that the code tick is hit, but the blueprint tick will never be hit actually because again, you can only have one that is working at a time unless you call super or manually call another event. So we can definitely fix this, don't worry. But you'll notice that if I add a breakpoint here, this never stops the game. Okay, so we can't actually just use event tick here if we have tick in the code. Now, what I like to do is actually really simple. Since this is a code project, I do have it in the code. So if you're following the third person tutorial series and the blueprint only input buffer, you could run into this, this case. If you're just doing the blueprint only input buffer, you won't run into this. But otherwise, if you're like me, you could run into it, in which case we wanna go ahead and address it. So there's a very simple solution here. This is a little bit hacky because you don't really need two tick events here. But again, we're in a weird case where we're doing some of it in code and we have this other logic in the blueprint. So it's perfectly fun to do this. We can add a blueprint tick. So we can say we can just call it the blueprints tick. We'll say uh, we won't override anything. We'll just call it void BP tick. I spell it right, and I'll pass in delta time, same as regular tick, just like this. Now, we don't want it to just be this standard code function. We actually want to make it a U function that is a blueprint implementable event. This way we can call it in the code, but we can fill out the logic in the blueprint like we're already doing. So we're going to make it a U function, blueprint implementable event. And you don't have to give it a category. A lot of times I won't, but since the other uh, blueprint implementable events in this function do have one, I'll give it one and I will just say tick. There you go. Okay. And so we can save this and we can go to the CPP. We can go to our tick function here and we can just call the BP tick. Pass in the delta time. Uh, there we go. And now I can launch it again. And when it's back open, I will come back to you. All right, the editor is back open, so I'm just gonna go to my base character blueprint. And now you can see I have my event tick logic in here. I'm gonna remove event tick, and instead I'm going to capture my BP tick, event BP tick. And then at this point, I can drag that into the branch. And then when we do that, if I compile and save, it should work as intended because we are going to load this up we're going to click on our base character bp and you should see cur tick will be moving the entire time oh actually we need to make it visible that would certainly help so let's try that again cur tick here you go and so now you can see it goes from 0 to 59 so every frame There you go. You can see it moving. And so that'll keep track of our inputs on each frame of that given second. And it'll help us store a lot of data and, and transfer between different objects. Like if we have to go from the input buffer and check and compare against the command, we'll have all the data there that we can compare right on the spot. So anyway, guys, that's all I got for you today. But thank you so much for watching. If this helped you convert your frames, your seconds to frames in your blueprint only input buffer series, then please subscribe. That's more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do. I just really appreciate it. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon members and supporters. Thank you guys so much for all the love and support. I am really incredibly grateful for everything that you've done. And just being willing to help me out means more than you could know. Thank you so much. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. There's a link in the description. I'd be happy to help you out. It's completely free. We'll get you set up and moving along. Anyway, guys, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.